Good morning, everybody. Would you please stand for God's word? If you're able. Today's reading is from Matthew, beginning at the fifth chapter. Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. Remember that as long as heaven and earth last, not the least point nor the smallest detail of the law will be done away with not until the end of all things. So then, whoever disobeys even the least important of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be least in the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, whoever obeys the law and teaches others to do the same will be great in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you then that you will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven only if you are more faithful than the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in doing what God requires. You ready to go deep? How deep you want to go? The deeper, the better. I like that, Jim. Uh, I took some pills a little while ago, and I have one stuck. And almost half a cinnamon roll apparently didn't do it. I left it on the plate in case somebody wanted to buy it. It's half price. I did not bite off of it. I tore it off. I am a diabetic, you know, I was trying to be. We're going to talk today about a topic that most, uh, you're not going to hear much about it in, in, in most uh, churches today. Uh, but the thing is, with the current generation of uh, what's called Gen Xers and, and Millennials coming along, it's it's uh, one of the arguments that's often used against biblical Christianity. And that argument has to do with the tension between the grace of God and the law of God. <coughs> what happens, most folks... <coughs> who don't read the Bible on a regular basis, they don't study it, they don't know it, they don't know its author. People that are looking for justification of sin rather than the transformation of life will often use that argument. And unfortunately, today, there's some in, in this country, particularly, there are some professing Christians who use it too. I've, I've told you about my son in Florida who had to pull himself away from a very large contemporary non-denominational church down there because in the small groups, his small group leader kept pressing the fact that, they didn't, they live, that we live under an age of grace and not under the old covenant of the law, so they didn't even need to study the Old Testament scriptures. Now, that kind of thing is a lie from the father of lies, who is the devil. Jesus identified him as the father of lies. And those who are apart, separated from God, are going to use this lie in an attempt to force the follower of Jesus, followers of Jesus to compromise their principles. Do you see that taking effect in our nation? 
we actually have what would have at one time been considered uh, evangelical denominations who are now compromising biblical principle in order to become more acceptable to the culture. It kind of just negates God saying, come out from among them and be different. Or his words, be holy, for I am holy. You know, listen, we just need to understand that, that lost folks are going to do what lost folks do, and that's rebel against the truth. So when you try to make a biblical argument with people that are separated from God, that's not going to make any sense to them. But, but this isn't really about lost people. This, the, the real danger of this lie is when it's used by those who are followers of the Lord Jesus, but they use it as an excuse for spiritual fa uh, failure or deliberate sins. You know, sometimes hear the words, it's ten words. Thank God I live under grace and not the law. Nowadays when I hear that, I think it's just a flighty way to justify your failures rather than bear the responsibility of failing and just confessing it and repenting and accepting the consequences that come with it. Whether it's a lost person or a backsliding Christian, when, when they hear the truth, and even when it's presented in love, you know, simply, you know what you're doing isn't right. What's, what's the verse that they like to quote? Just say it. Yes, that's exactly right. They like to quote that verse from Jesus in that same Sermon on the Mount from which Mel read, <coughs> excuse me, in Matthew chapter 7, when he said, do not judge so that you won't be judged. Okay? That seems to be the only verse that they know because the second part of it says, just remember that you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others and you will be measured by the same measure that you use. And then that little phrase, why don't you look at the splinter in your brother's eye? Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye and not notice that great big beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to the brother, let me take your splinter out of your eye uh, when there's a beam of wood in your own eye? The rest of that passage says this. Hypocrite! <coughs> Who's he calling a hypocrite there? The one who's pointing the finger and judging. But he's calling him a hypocrite because he knows that the one pointing and judging is guilty of greater sin than even the one they're pointing the finger at. So what does he say to him? He says, first take the beam of wood out of your eye. And then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Do you realize what he's saying there is get your life straightened up and live clean and holy. And that way, when you do this, you're not a hypocrite. So it's not really saying don't judge ever. It's saying to judge with a righteous judgment. Let me tell you something. If we're part of the same family of God and we will not allow other members of the family to hold us accountable and say what you're doing is not right and accept it, We need to take a close look at whether or not we really have a relationship with Jesus.
If you look at Matthew chapter, if you look at Matthew chapter seven verse six, which we just talked about, or Matthew chapter seven verses fifteen and twenty, be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravaging wolves. You'll, you'll recognize them by their fruit. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he, there he's talking about judging with the righteous judgment. You judge with the righteous judgment. So Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 5 has to do with followers holding each other to the same standards. It's not about not judging at all. It's about I'm holding you to the same standard that I hold myself to. Because this is the way God is going to judge me and he's going to judge you the same way. And so I am calling you out because I don't want you to stand before God guilty. Okay? We are responsible at times to be the faithful wounds of a friend, as it's described in the Proverbs. When someone we love and respect is acting or walking or speaking in error or in sin. Now, there are ways to do that. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, let me say ways that we don't do it. We don't do it on Facebook. That used to be a problem in this church when we were early and young that uh, folks would call each other out on Facebook but never have a face-to-face -face conversation. Let me tell you something. If you do that and I see it, I'm going to call you out, but not on Facebook. You don't do it on Facebook. You don't do it in a small group setting and you don't do it with an anonymous note none of those are biblical or Christ like but if it needs to be done it should be done biblically according to Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 through 19 where Jesus talking about this very thing and it's one of the two places where he used the word church he said if this happens you go to that brother that's doing something offensive and you try to make it right. And if that doesn't, if he doesn't change or, or, or accept your counsel, then you go back a second time and you take someone with you as a witness to this. And then if they still refuse, then you take them before the church for disciplinary action. And if they will not listen to the church, they become as an outsider to you as if they're an unbeliever so most of us don't have the courage to, to take those steps which is why we like to call people out in other ways don't do that because when you do that you sin okay I've gotten anonymous letters in my life as a pastor and uh, there was a time when those things caused me great anxiety all of you could send me anonymous letters now, and they'd all go in the trash can. Yeah. We need to be bigger than that. We need to be people that when there's issues within our own body of believers, or even with people in other bodies, but they're part of the body of Christ, if they're doing things, saying things, holding on to attitudes that are just uh, uh, unbiblical and unchristlike. If we love them at all, we need to be able to at least talk to them and say, you know, I see you doing this, and it just kind of rings as something that a follower of Jesus shouldn't be doing. Yeah. You become, a, war you become a, a watchman. You become the one who warns to save them from judgment. Now, <coughs> can we get back to the point? <laughs> Who got off on this? Anyway, what we're talking about here is this one fundamental truth today. The grace of God is not a lifelong get out of hell free card. You know, some people will view it that way. We live under grace. And Paul ran into this problem. He addressed it in the book of Romans. You know, people thought, well, you know, if God's grace is sufficient and it's, it's boundless and limitless, then we can do anything we want because his grace is going to cover it. That's not what it is. 
The grace of God is the act of a loving and holy God to provide a way for weak, sinful, depraved humans to be forgiven and transformed. Now, grace does not trump the law, nor does it render the law null and void. Jesus said that in the passage that Mel read from the Sermon on the Mount. The moral law is as much God's inspired and inerrant word as are the Gospels and the book of Acts and the letters of Paul and Peter and John and James and the Revelation. And it still is relevant to the followers of Jesus today as it was when God first spoke them. Now... If you go back to the passage that Mel read in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, what Jesus is saying there is that he models the righteousness demanded by God. That's the perfect life. The life that God demanded of those that would follow him and trust and obey him in the Old Testament Every one of them failed. Jesus came along and he modeled that righteousness perfectly. And everything that he taught perfectly aligned with all that God demanded and expected in the Old Testament. So in other words, everything he said and did affirmed the validity of the law and prophets. And when he spoke of the law and the prophets, it was a reference to all of the Old Testament scriptures that they had. And not only did Jesus say he did not come to abolish those things, he said he came to fulfill them. Now, if you've got the time and you've got a copy of the scriptures, flip over to the book of Romans. Well, I love to hear the sound of turning pages. I know some of you are using electronic devices and I can't hear those. Romans chapter 10. And if you look at verse 4, Paul wrote, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. To whom? Everyone who believes. Okay? So the grace is not extended to the world for everybody to just live any way they want to. Christ is the end of the righteousness to everyone who believes. (coughs) So in other words, because the Lord Jesus paid the penalty for the sins of believers on the cross... His righteousness, remember the diagram last week, is poured into and onto us so that we stand righteous before God. Not sinless, but righteous. He made a way for us to be forgiven when we sin, even in a righteous state. Remember, John, in his first letter, wrote, If we confess our sins... A little earlier in that passage, he said, if we say we have no sin, we lie. And we make God out to be a liar. But if we confess our sins, we can always depend on him to forgive us and to cleanse us from every unrighteousness. How many? Hey, keep those accounts short, okay? God's given you the Holy Spirit if you're a believer, if you follow him, if you follow the Lord Jesus, he has sent you the Spirit to live within you for the purpose of conviction and correction and instruction. So, remember we talked so much about unleashing the Spirit, not quenching the Spirit. You know, don't, when the Spirit brings conviction to you about something that you've said or done, deal with it quickly. 
How long does it take to say, oh, Lord, that was so wrong, and that's my sin nature taking over, and I am confessing it to you right now. Please forgive me for that. If we confess our sins, we can always depend on him to forgive us and to cleanse us. The problem is we all have such busy lives. Number one, we don't get into the Word enough. We don't pray enough. Number two, we're so busy that when the Spirit quickens us about something, whether it's conviction or instruction, we delay. And then all of a sudden the sin begins to mount up, and with every time that we resist the Holy Spirit by not dealing with it quickly, it becomes easier for us to not take care of it the next time when he convicts us. And suddenly if we find ourselves feeling further away from God, more dist- God seems more distant to us, he's not hearing our prayers, and we say, what's going on? And we don't realize that we've just allowed this accumulation of uh, manure, so to speak, to pile up in our lives. Our lives become like a stench to God. We've been redeemed then we've gone back to wallowing in the mud. Jesus showed us how to live because we couldn't. That was why he lived that perfect life, so that we could see how it's done, but also so that he could be that perfect sacrifice. The one that would die for the sins of the world. You can read about all that in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through the end of the chapter. Okay? And then uh, if you look at uh, when he talks about uh, moving from being slaves to sin to slaves of God. You remember I told you one time that I went through a witnessing course where I had to do a great deal of memorization it's called continuous witness training. And, and the reason they called it continuous witness training was not because they wanted you to be a continuing witness, but because it felt like the training would never end, I believe. Because it was six months of training. And one of the verses that I had to memorize, it was actually two verses, was Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, which said, uh, because we... It starts with the words, therefore. And what does therefore mean in the scripture? Look back. Look back at the verses before it. And he had said, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its lust. (coughs) Neither yield your members to sin as instruments of righteousness, eyes, tongue, ears, hands, but yield yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death into life and your instruments to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under law but the grace. If You consider yourself dead to sin and alive to the Lord Jesus. Now, remember in that great Romans chapter 7 passage next in that letter, he writes about the fact that there's this constant tension in his own life between doing what he knows he should do and then realizing that he's often doing what he doesn't want to do. Ends that thing with, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God for our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's modeled this righteousness demanded by God. His teachings are aligned with everything that God demands and expects. And uh, now we have to say, well, does the law matter? Does it really matter? Well, 
to answer that question, let's ask another question. Is sin still repulsive to God? Well, there you go. Sin is still sin in God's eyes. It darkens the hearts of men and women. And the more we yield to temptation and submit to the things that God says are sinful, the darker and the harder our hearts become. And if we are believers and we have the Holy Spirit living in us, the more often we reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the easier it becomes to grow cold to his direction and conviction. The law is the law. Initially written by the finger of God on the tablets and then expanded to other laws that he gave. And even as New Testament followers of Jesus who live under the freedom of his great grace, we have a responsibility to respect and to obey certain parts of the law. So what do we mean by law? What, what, what did Jesus mean by law in this passage that we read a little early in Matthew chapter 5? <coughs> that term law was applied to four things in first century Israel. Okay? First, it, it, it applied to the Ten Commandments. Okay? Our relationship to God and our relationship to other people. Now, let me, let me tell you something. I'll give you something here. The Ten Commandments are a combination of of ceremonial and s ceremonial law, civil law, and moral law. For instance, part of the ceremonial law was the Sabbath. Now, I'm not suggesting that the principle of the Sabbath was ceremonial. I'm suggesting the designation of a single day for everybody. The Sabbath was the Sabbath for the Jews. This was a particular race, a particular nation to whom God gave ceremonial and civil laws. Circumcision. It's not in the Ten Commandments, but was it that the sign of the covenant? So do you think that parents that choose not to have their male children circumcised in Africa or Asia or in the United States? Are breaking the law if they choose not to have their baby boys circumcised? That was a ceremonial law for the Jews. Okay? The term law also referred to the first five books of the Bible that we know, what they called the Torah or the law, sometimes it was called the Pentateuch, five books. It was history, and it contained ceremonial law, and civil law, and moral law. That's the, where we get the ceremonial law of the circumcision. Okay? That's where we get the ceremonial law about not wearing any kind of clothing that was made from two different fabrics. That's where we got the ceremonial law for making, not making any markings on the skin or cuttings in the flesh. Like the prophets of Baal and Asherah would cut themselves to try to get the attention of their God when they were in the battle with Elijah. Does that apply to modern day ink? Not necessarily. That's not a moral stipulation. 
And let's face it, there's some ink that's detestable, but it's not because just because it's ink. I have ink. My ink is tasteful unless you're Islamic. And, and then, it, because it's written in Koine Greek, so I w it would have made, immediately identify as a Christian. Uh, we have to be careful about it. And the, it, the law also in, in, involved the entire Old Testament uh, that we know that they had that included history and poetry and ceremonial and civil and moral laws. Uh, and then... <clears throat> And by the way, the, the civil laws were the things that, that God established for them, like uh, uh, it was a combination of ceremonial and civil when he gave them instructions on where to bury their refuse outside the camp. <coughs> but when he was talking about people that needed to be killed, you know, if you find somebody that's practicing witchcraft, put them to death. If you find somebody practicing homosexuality, put them to death. If you find somebody uh, who, who has uh, uh, committed adultery, put them to death. Why do we not do that now? couple of things. Number one, we are not the Jewish nation. These ceremonial and civil laws were given to the Jewish nation at a time <clears throat> when they were going to take over a land that God was giving them that was possessed by a number of people, groups that worshipped false gods and engaged in all kinds of, of illicit and sexual behavior uh, in deference to the gods that they worshipped. And God did not want his people getting involved in any of that. So rather than have the chance of that happening, his law was, if you encounter these people, you kill them. And if you encounter it within your own people, put them to death. Jewish civil law does not apply to us. And neither does Jewish ceremonial law. Neither does Jewish ceremonial law unless you want it to. I mean, there are people that choose to not eat pork, and that's fine. You know, that's where we don't pose some kind of legalism and say, hey, hey, you know, you can't be a follower of Jesus if you eat pork. You know, <laughs> hey. I not only eat pork, I ingest it at every opportunity I can get it. Uh, and by the way, if you think back, those folks had no way to prepare pork and other kinds of meat uh, to protect them from, from the parasitic things like trichinosis at that time and God knew that he's protecting them with these laws but the moral laws that God established we're responsible for every one of them the moral laws you don't kill you don't steal you don't commit adultery you don't covet somebody else's stuff or their uh, relationships or anything like that. We're responsible for all of that. People say that Jesus never spoke about homosexuality. Well, he did speak about marriage, and in speaking about marriage, he says that it was God's design from the start that marriage would be between a man and a woman. That's New Testament. So, yeah. By the way, where we really get into trouble 
is the fourth place, fourth way, fourth, the number four way that law was defined was that it included at the time of Jesus what's called oral or scribal law. O-R-A-L or scribal, S-C-R-I-B-A-L, written by the scribes. There were 613 of them total. And these were, uh, the scribes were men who were committed to taking the principles of God's laws and developing rules and regulations to explain them and make them simpler. It's kind of like the scribes were the congressmen of today. You know? They can take a simple thing and make it 40,000 pages and nobody reads it including the congressman, right? They were committed to doing this so, so that these 613 laws with their caveats and explanations <coughs> were passed down verbally and they used them until the mid-third century. So 250 years after Jesus had ascended into heaven, the Jews were still using this, this oral or scribal law, and then they wrote them down as what the Jews now call the Mishnah. And the Mishnah became a part of the Talmud, T-A-L-M-U-D. Now, when you hear in the, or read in the New Testament in these gospel accounts of things like... Uh, uh, the, the scribes and Pharisees getting upset because Jesus heals a man who, who was lame and told him to get up and, and, and pick up his bed and, and go, that they were more concerned that this was the Sabbath day and he was working on the Sabbath by carrying his mat than they were about the fact that he had been healed. That was part of the Mishnah. Okay? So... What we got here, the Old Testament is, is really filled with great spiritual principles. And perhaps the most important thing to remember is that those principles and, and laws are simply to remind us that in all things a person must seek God's will. And when he or she knows it, he or she must dedicate themselves to obedience. And that's exactly what Jesus did during his earthly life. He lived this perfect life according to the laws of God, not man-made laws, but the laws of God. <coughs> he spoke what the Father wanted him to speak and did what the Father wanted him to do. He said, I, I can only say what I hear the Father saying. I can only do what I see the Father doing. Uh, even his thoughts brought glory to God. The writer of the Hebrews tells us that he was tempted in every way as we are. And by the way, I get chastised about this from people that are far more intelligent and sharper than I am. Uh, but it hasn't changed my belief. And that is that because Jesus was born of Mary, he had a sin nature. And I justify that by using that Hebrews passage to say he could not have been tempted in every way as we are if he was incapable of sinning. Does that make sense? Yeah. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet he did not sin. And that final act of obedience to God was to submit to the death on the cross, even though it was undeserved. But that was so he could give to us something that's undeserved. And that's grace. So what does this mean for those of us who follow Jesus? What's the relationship for you and me between the law and grace. What we have to remember is that God's moral laws are perpetual and permanent. 
It is the same today as it was in the time of Moses and David and Solomon and Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. It applies to us. We're going to talk a little bit more about this next week when we talk about the risk of grace. If you look at verses 21 and following, in Matthew chapter 5, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 5. He talks about this, you know. He talks about murder in God's eyes being equated with hatred. He talks about sacrifice and obedience. He talks about adultery and lust. He talks about divorce versus permanence. He talks, he talks about revenge versus loving our enemies. You know, he's talking to these people, and they lived in a, in a culture where the religious leaders said, as long as you don't do it, then you're good. And Jesus was saying, if you think about it, you've done it. God knows, because God knows your thoughts. Jesus let us know that God's not concerned, as, as concerned, he's concerned, but he's not as concerned with what's going on on the outside as he is what's going on in the heart. So while you might not get caught in the act, Jesus says, hey, have you even entertained the act in your heart and mind? It renders you guilty before a holy God. Let's do an exercise. Everybody still with me? You still engaged? Are you, are you shaking your head? No. Uh, I want you to think and I know this is going to be tough for some of you. I want you to think, and, and God's going to understand this, okay? I want, you to I want you to think about the last thing that you were thinking that you know was displeasing to God. Just real quick, just let it run through your mind. And then I want to ask you, can you imagine, ever imagine God having that kind of thought? Hatred, revenge, lust. I don't know, what, what would God lust after? But then Jesus was here on earth in a physical body with a sin nature. And he was surrounded by women and he was surrounded at times by by extravagance and wealth. And he was surrounded by people that wanted to make him king. You know, all of these things, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Yeah. And Jesus is saying, oh, it's not just enough not to do these things. You've got to take every thought. I really believe he put that in Paul's mind. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. You put Every, you take every thought captive to obey Christ. I've had people say to me, you know, I don't, how, how, do you, how do you fight these temptations, these thoughts that come into your mind? And I tell them, you know, you get to control how long it stays in there. Yeah, God made these minds of ours, these brains, and they're just magnificent things that uh, humanity will never be able to duplicate but he's given us some control over it. So while we may not be able to control what goes into our eyes or ears or what we feel or think, well, we can control what we think because we can control how long it stays there. And that's what Paul meant when he said, take every thought captive to obey Christ. You've got to put it out of your head. You're probably going to have to substitute something for it. That's why it's good to memorize Scripture. So what if we, as followers of Jesus, 
It's you and me now. What if we as followers of Jesus said, you know what? Not going to commit adultery, not going to commit fornication, because I know that single adults think that they've been freed up from the fornication clause. They think that only applies to teenagers. We tell our teenagers, don't have sex. But if I happen to be 40 years old and not married, I can have sex because I'm an adult and I'm at that point. No, it's not. Fornication is fornication, whether it's being done by a 16-year-old or a 60-year-old. Okay? And I know that you don't like to hear that, and some of you may not come back, but that's okay. Anyway, <laughs> suppose we don't commit adultery, we don't commit fornication, we don't commit murder, we don't have old hatred for, towards anybody, including Muslims and politicians. We don't hold grudges. We don't fail to take responsibility for our own actions and words towards others. And we do everything within our power to avoid divorce we, we don't repay evil with evil. We treat our enemies with love. We are very generous in helping those in need. And we don't worry because we live in obedience. And we know that God will supply our needs. We don't steal. We don't lie. We don't gossip. We don't use language that is unbecoming to someone who's a follower of Jesus. We honor our parents no matter how old or irritating they are. We refuse to take God's name in vain, not only with the GD reference, but with the oh my God stuff like that. We do not get drunk. The Bible doesn't teach teetotalism. If you think that's liberty or license to drink as much as you want, moderation, my friend, that's a biblical principle. We don't get drunk. We don't abuse medications. You know, this list could go on and on and on. We don't do those things because, because God's moral laws are the framework of the righteousness that we could not achieve on our own, and it's the righteousness that he requires. So Jesus did it for us. Came and lived that perfect, righteous life. <laughs> and then he died for us as the perfect sacrifice so that our sins could be forgiven. He's raised from the dead. He's now seated at the right hand of God to make intercession for us when we fail. He sends the Holy Spirit to live within us as a gift. And he is there to convict us when we sin so that we can turn and repent to, to teach us what is the right thing to do when we have questions about that and to empower us to overcome temptation. And with his righteousness poured into us, we have a righteousness that then, what did he say at the bottom of that? Let's see. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven well, let me tell you something, friends, with what we just talked about. With his righteousness poured into us and our obedience, we have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. Well, wait a minute now. If his righteousness is poured into us, why do we need to do good things? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, First of all, I want you to understand that it's not so much good things that we need to do, but it's God things. Okay. Uh, we had this discussion in, in this small group on Wednesday nights a couple of weeks ago. And I think we talked about it again last Sunday. But non-Christian people can do good things. We need to be doing God things. You see, the Pharisees believed that their righteous behavior would get them into heaven and bring them honor to, before God. You know? Remember in Luke 18, that Pharisee, what, that baby giraffe is not coming yet. Okay, all right. You just said you were joking, and I thought you were taking it. 
All right, all right. I, I didn't mean to distract y'all. I, I didn't mean to distract y'all. Uh, listen, the motivation for if he, Luke chapter 18, there's two guys that go into the temple to pray. Jesus is telling this story. And he says one of them is a Pharisee, and so he stands up and he prays. And there's nothing wrong with the way his posture, because that's what they did then. They stood to pray. And they'd stretch out their arms. And so he's praying, and, he's, and they'd look up to heaven. And he's praying, and he says, oh, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I, I, and he started listing all the good things that he does. And he says, I'm grateful that I'm not like other men and I'm not like this guy over here. But then you got the other guy over there that wouldn't even lift up his head, Jesus said, to, to look into heaven. And he just kind of hit himself on the chest. And all he was saying was, God, be merciful to me. God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, who do you think went home justified that day? You know, it's, it's, it's what's in the heart that God's concerned about. <clears throat> for the Pharisees and for a lot of people that do good works, their motivation is, is, is self-serving. They want to be recognized by others and they want to be honored by God. They hope that when it comes time for judgment that the scales will be tipped in the good deeds category to get them into heaven. It doesn't work that way. But for those who are humbled, but for those who are humbled by the greatness of God, for those who are humbled by the undeniable repulsiveness of our own sins before God, for those of us who are humbled enough to realize that the Lord Jesus is our only hope. The Holy Spirit opens our lives to his righteousness. And when that happens, we can be born again. God the Father draws us. The Spirit convicts us. The Lord Jesus saves us. And once we are born again, the motive of our works is to please and bring glory to God. Again, Paul, Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. It's pretty simple. Easy. You could memorize it right now. Whatever you do in word or deed, you do it all for the glory of God. That simple. Whether you're in your home, whether you're on the job, whether you're in church, whether you're in a restaurant, whether you're in a traffic jam, whatever you do in word and deed, you do it all to the glory of God. And yeah, Zane, you said that there's a couple reasons. What's the other? And I, I'll put it to you this way. James chapter 2 says something about faith that does not produce good works. Do you know what it says? It says that faith is dead. So it's not the good works that bring faith and salvation. It's the faith in Christ and the salvation that should then begin to produce the good works in our lives and obedience to the moral laws of God. It's that simple. So what does Jesus' life and teaching about this reveal to us about the law? Here's a couple things. Number one, reverence for God the Father and respect for others is the sum of the law. Jesus said when he was asked by, by a Pharisee or a lawyer, a scribe, really, one of the scribes, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, uh, you know the law. What does it say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. 
Jesus said the second one's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot separate the two. Okay? Matthew chapter 22. That's where that's found. Reverence for God the Father and respect for the others. For others is the sum of the law. When you do those two things, you're keeping the law. So doing those two things, loving God with all that we are and have while loving our neighbors as ourselves, fulfills the law and the prophet. Did you know that those two, those two things that Jesus said there, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 is where it says, love your neighbor as yourself. So he was quoting Old Testament when he said those things. And then the third thing is this, since Jesus' righteousness is poured into humans infected with the sin nature, he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us fulfill those two commandments. If you do those two things, you're going to keep all the law. Over in Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks about this. And this is where we're going to end. Galatians, chapter 5, verse 2. Listen, God doesn't want you to be a legalist. Every legalist I've ever met in the Christian life has been somebody that I didn't want to be like because they never seemed to be happy. They never seemed to be free. I've known a number of legalist pastors that I would not, I would be disqualified from their church simply because I had facial hair and tattoos. Yeah? Jesus sets us free. So Paul writes this. He says, for freedom, Christ sets us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. What's the yoke of slavery he's talking about? It's the slavery to sin. <clears throat> and this is one. Of, this is one of the churches where these Judaizers, these false prophets, were or false teachers were coming in and saying, "You can be a Christian by surrendering to Jesus, but you also have to be circumcised." They called them Judaizers. They were, they said you had to become Jewish before you could become a Christian. Take note, I Paul am telling you that if you get yourself circumcised, Christ will not benefit you at all. Why? Because they would think that that was what they needed to do to get into heaven. I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is entire, in, obligated to do the entire law if he does that. So in other words, if you follow their teaching and you become a Jew, then you're responsible for fulfilling all of the ceremonial and civil and moral laws. You who are trying to be justified, the law are alienated from Christ and have fallen from grace. For we eagerly await through the Spirit by faith the hope of righteousness. So, you know, we have the Holy Spirit. He's the one that will help us to fulfill those two great commandments. He is the one that will convict us when we sin. He is the one who will direct us in whatever it is that God wants us to do. Any of this make sense to you? Do you have a better understanding of how we relate to the Old Testament law now? We're freed from ceremonial and civil, but we still are bound to the moral. Let's pray together. God, help us as your spirit begins to woo us. When the spirit begins to call to our attention those things in our lives that need to be dealt with 
in order for our relationship with you to be what you want it to be. Help us to hear him and to obey. For those who are wrestling with besetting sin, set them free today, God. For those who have struggled perhaps in a relationship with a friend or family member who's used some of these very arguments today to argue against the Scripture, may this give them courage and insight to be able to more intelligently witness to those family members and friends. God, most of all, I pray that you would help those of us who believe, who are followers, to do everything within our power to, to, to live up to your expectations of us. Remind us that that begins with humility and submission. Because none of us in our own strength can do the things you want us to do or live the way you want us to live. That's why you've given us the gift of the Spirit. So help us to trust you and obey you. To be sensitive to the voice and direction of the Spirit. And God, help us to take our thoughts captive, to obey you. Help us, Lord, to let no unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but only that which would do good to others and impart grace to those who hear our words. Help us to be quick to hear your voice, slow to speak to others in any way other than gracious speech and slow to anger because anger never accomplishes the will of God. Glorify yourself in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I got a couple of elders back there. I want you to turn around and look at them. Okay. I'm not telling you they're the most handsome guys in the world. But I'm going to tell you this. If you have a need today, whether it's a need to know Christ or a need to, to, to be forgiven of some sin, they're not your confessional, but they are guys that know how to pray. They love God. They're familiar with his word. And if you need to talk to me or to them about anything or you need prayer for something, see one of us before you leave, okay? Thank you for coming Wednesday night and then Thursday night with Brother Yoon. Look forward to seeing you.